Hey everybody, thanks for uh, joining again for another one of our coffee sessions. I appreciate it. I've got, I've got my hot chocolate and I also have my glass of water. So I think I'm all set to go. So um, we're going to do our format the way we have the last few times. Um, so our moderator again for today's session is Jenny Laramore. And so you guys can all get your questions into Jenny um, through the chat or however you get them into Jenny or Jenny, why don't you, anything you, instructions you need to give, please. Thanks, Kevin. Um, just like past sessions, I put the information in the chat for you. You can type to me directly or you can chat publicly your questions and we'll make sure and get an answer for you. Thanks, Kevin. Okay, thank you, Jenny. Appreciate it. Um, so, as usual, um, I'm sure we will have lots to talk about. So, why don't you tell me what's on your mind and what you want to talk about? Okay, first up, Kevin, we have a question. When do employees need to come back to work in the office? Um, okay. Um, so, Jenny, it's fair to say that question is about um, like this summer when we uh, come out of our COVID protocols and back to more normal. Um, either that or I'll just tell everybody eight o'clock tomorrow will be fine. Just come on back. Um, sorry, I shouldn't be silly. Um, Yes, so we're setting a tentative date um, and this should work for what we have so far. And I think in, uh, one of our emails went out today, uh, system-wide with uh, a lot more detail on it than I uh, would give you right now, but we're targeting for June 28th. So um, we wanna begin our transition back to normal operations uh, starting June 28th. The reasoning behind that is that between now and June 28th, that will hopefully give our campus plenty of time uh, for all of our campus community, faculty, staff, and students um, who want to get a vaccination to be able to get a vaccination for them to be wildly avail uh, widely available. So we're targeting June 28th to return towards normal operations, but that doesn't mean that on June 28th, everybody has to be back and that everything must be as it was before. That means starting June 28th is when we start to transition. What the goal is really to have um, our fully functional back to normal operations by August 2nd. So that'll give us um, a more than a full month to get everybody transitioned, figure out what some of those nuances are. Um, now how that's going to occur in each office is going to be up to their office leadership and their supervisors in conjunction with our current health requirements and guidelines to make sure we have time to work through those things. So short answer, sorry, too late, is uh, June 28th is when we can start that transition with the goal of by August 2nd, we're back into those more normal operations. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, next question. When can we have events on campus again with more than 50 people? Okay. Um, similar answer. Uh, we're again planning August or sorry, June 28th as our start date for that. At some point, we had to uh, pick a deadline. Um, and, and by looking at June 28th, we think we're giving the right amount of time. Um, our public health guidance uh, may change that yeah, if, if COVID-19 activity increases, if we have another broad outbreak or surge. But our goal is by June 28th and after to be able to host larger events again. Um, we are going to continue to evaluate those policies all the way through June to determine if we need to make any changes, but that's the guideline. Now, the first question someone might have is, well, what if I wanted to do an event on June 27th? and not June 29th. And the answer is at some point we had to pick a day. And I understand that some areas might have wanted to do something before that, but that's the day we're gonna look at. And so after June 28th is when we hope to be able to host all those larger events again. Okay, 
Thanks, Kevin. Next question. Any thoughts on whether ISU will be requiring vaccines for students returning to campus this fall? Um, yes, I have lots of thoughts on that, but I actually only have one answer. Um, last week, some of you might have noticed or seen um, that the governor, uh, Governor Little signed an executive order that banned any state of Idaho entity, a governmental entity from requiring a vaccine in order to, for them to receive our, our services as a public entity or to be able to access our facilities. So essentially what that means for us is that the university is prohibited from requiring a vaccine in order for someone to receive our services or educational services or to access our facilities. So the short answer of all of that is uh, we will not be requiring vaccines. Thanks, Kevin. Next question, will we be doing the screening program again this fall or summer semester for those who have not been on campus and are returning? Um, well, we are going to still have screening sites at um, uh, in Pocatello and in Idaho Falls and Meridian. We will still have a location where someone can get screened. Uh, because until we're through this pandemic, screening is still going to be important. But what we're not doing is the screening program. We're not going to have a, uh, we'll no longer be mandating a COVID screening program for the general campus community. What we have found is that there will be certain parts of our campus, certain groups that will need to continue screening. Just one example is um, our student athletes, for example the NCAA still requires screening. And so we have to have a screening program up and running. Also, having a screening uh, site and ability to do it is going to be very important for people who uh, need it because they're going to travel um, and to support contact tracing. If we do have cases on campus and in the campus community, having that screening available so that we can test um, faculty and staff and students if there is an outbreak so that we can rapidly respond and address the health and safety. So we're going to continue to have a screening capability. We're just no longer going to do a, a screening site with uh, mandatory screening or reaching out to groups and saying you have to be screened. We're going to use it when it makes sense. Now, for those who think they've been exposed and for those who have symptoms, um, then we are going to use the University Health Center and our health partners in the community um, to be able to test individuals who have symptoms of COVID-19. Um, so those testing locations will still continue or we will be affiliated with where we can get the testing done for someone who has the symptoms. So those will have to continue for a while as we continue to move through um, this pandemic, but we're not gonna have the, the mass uh, screening program like we had for the spring semester. And again, the why, the why behind that is the focus on vaccinations, um, getting people vaccinated, uh, pushing out the information on that and hoping that our campus community does the right thing. I got my vaccine um, and I'm encouraging everyone to do the same, do the right thing and get the vaccine so that we can get past this. That's, that's why we're able to um, not have the screening program going forward. Okay. Thanks, Kevin. I'm sure there will be more COVID related questions, but for now, if we could switch to budget, um, what can you tell us about the budget in particular tuition and fees? Okay. Um, there's a lot to that question. Um, let me just start with the budget. Um, although that's the harder one to answer because the reality is, is I do not have a lot of answers right now. Um, every year, the legislature sets <clears throat> our appropriated budget, and the, which is the amount of money the state gives us uh, that we can spend, which uh, represents the largest single piece of our budget. Uh, this year, the governor made a recommendation. The recommendation was good for Idaho State University, good for higher education overall. Um, that budget was drafted for Idaho State. Um, almost exactly as the governor had proposed it. 
not quite the same for some of our sister institutions, but for us, it was the governor's proposal, which was good for us. That budget um, passed the state Senate and went to the House of Representatives where that budget was voted down um, so that our budget died in the House of Representatives. There has not yet been a replacement budget bill drafted in the legislature. That means as of right now today, we do not know what our state appropriated budget will be. And again, as I said, that's the single largest piece of our entire budget. So since we don't know what our budget number will be, the best update I can give you is we still do not know um, what that will look like. Now, on a larger picture, we're going to finish this year. Um, we're on track to, I mean, we're still a couple of months away from finishing the fiscal year, but we're on track to be about break even in terms of our budget. The good news is, is break even is a good position to be in right now. The, the, the deeper explanation of that is the reason we're going to break even is because of the federal stimulus money that came in. The CARES 1 and CARES 2, there's two rounds of what they called CARES stimulus money that came in. Had it not been for that money, we wouldn't have broke even. We would have had a deficit because our revenues were so off because of COVID. So we're able to break even, but that's what the stimulus money was there for, is to, to help us get through this difficult year. So going forward, we, we're not really sure where we will be. Um, now, uh, to get to the other question, what about tuition? Yesterday, our governing board, the State Board of Education met um, at four o'clock in a special meeting and they voted to freeze undergraduate resident tuition and fees. So for our resident students who are undergraduates, there will be no increases in their tuition or fees going forward next year. Um, we will be bringing to the State Board of Education a request to increase the graduate tuition and out-of-state tuition. Um, some of the professional fees will be increased. So those can be requested to the state. That doesn't mean they will increase. The state still has to approve them, the State Board of Education. But there will be no increase in the base. Undergraduate resident tuition will be frozen at the rate it is right now. Did I answer that question well enough? So <laughs> um, next question, also related to budget. Do you think we'll have to cut our budget, cut our budget in order to get it approved by the house? I don't know. Um, it would be, ultimately it'd be wrong for me to speculate on what will happen. Um, all I know is when a budget bill dies on the floor of one of the houses of the legislature when it gets revoted on and comes back out it's never more money than it was before never seen that happen so in all likelihood the budget bill that will come out will not be as favorable as the one that was printed before Thanks, Kevin. Next question. The recent program health evaluations showed a disparity between the administrative council recommendations and the recommendations from our dean. What do you recommend faculty do to resolve the con contradictory recommendations? Sorry, can you read that again, Jenny? You bet. The recent program health evaluations showed a disparity between the administrative council recommendations and recommendations from our dean. What do you recommend faculty do to resolve the con contradictory recommendations? Thank you, sorry, the piece that I missed was program health. I wasn't sure what the question was about. Um, okay, first of all, um, um, I'm committed to open communication and transparency. I hope everybody knows that. I think um, all of our leadership team is working in that same direction. So I encourage all faculty, all faculty to talk with your dean and identify whatever this disparity is, whatever this concern is, and, and talk about it and, and try to address this. 
Our goal through this whole process when it comes to program health is to maintain open communication, to talk about these things. And so the process itself was designed to be transparent and open and to involve faculty, to have faculty involved in looking at their own programs. So we need to have that happen. If someone feels that that hasn't happened, then now's the time to address it. And the best way to address it is, is directly, professionally, um, and to, to bring it up and, and in open communication, talk about it. So I encourage anyone who has that concern about this disparity to bring it up and have the conversation. Okay, thanks, Kevin. Next, um, we're gonna get, get back to the subject of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. um, this, this person is wondering if face masks will be required when we all return. Well, the plan is not to have that. But I won't definitively say we won't have it or we will have it because I think we have to continue to monitor the public health guidance. We're gonna to continue to monitor the CDC guidance. We're going to monitor what the outbreak looks like. Um, at this point, I don't know. The goal would be to try to get back to normal and not have that. But we will continue to monitor that all through the summer. And as we get closer to fall, hopefully we'll be able to make a definitive statement on that right now. Um, it's a bit too early. Okay, um, same topic. Will the health exception form process still be needed this summer and fall? Well, definitely for the beginning of the summer. Again, we're targeting um, June 28th for things to transition back to more normal before June 28th. Our current guidelines, our current requirements, our current protocols all remain in place. We're not out of this pandemic yet. It's still here. It's still happening. Now is not the time to relax. And if you, listening to any of the, the experts, the medical experts nationally and, and in our state and in our region, they're all saying just because we have the vaccines now, they're not yet rolled out now is not the time to relax our protocols. So we will continue to have our protocols in place until at least June 28th. Then we, along the way, we're gonna continue to have these conversations related to our internal COVID guidelines and our processes as summer progresses and as the medical guidance evolves. But at least until June 28th, the answer is yes, all of our guidelines and requirements will stay in place. Hey, on the same topic of returning in the fall, what are your hopes for the fall and what can we expect? I'm very much looking forward to having students back on campus. I look forward to that so much, it's hard to put into words. Um, the idea of having us all come back together as a community is heartening. I look forward to that so much. One of our colleagues described it to me as, we're used to being a community of scholars and for the last year we've been separated and that doesn't feel right. Um, how many times have I said my favorite day of work, bar none, is the first day of fall classes when our campus turns from a quieter uh, summer campus to all of a sudden the vibrancy and the energy of having all the students. I am so looking forward to that. What are my hopes for the fall? My hopes for the fall is that we have a return of our students, a return of our community of scholars, a return of our campus community in the way that is very close to what we were used to before and that we celebrate that and that we enjoy that and we use that to its fullest potential to help further our mission, to educate these students, to help better their lives through education. That's my hope for the fall. Okay, next question, Kevin. Given the recent CDC announcing that 5,800 individuals who were fully vaccinated got COVID-19, when we know there are those that have died even when fully vaccinated, how do we address those rising issues? 
I will be fully vaccinated by the end of the month and do not feel comfortable being around people. How do I teach in a classroom and how am I protected? Hmm. Well, thank you for the question. And I'm sorry um, about the stress that that may be causing the person who asked the question. Um, on some level, I'm the wrong person to ask that question to, but I will do my best to answer from my perspective. But I'm not trying to claim expertise or medical expertise. You all know that's not my background. This is my understanding. My understanding is there's one piece of the premise of that question that I'm not sure I can agree with. I'm not disagreeing with it. I just don't know. But my understanding is while it is still possible, to contract COVID-19 when fully vaccinated, that the medical science is saying that the vaccinations prevent serious illness and death. You can still get COVID, but you won't get serious illness or death. That's the understanding. That's how it's been explained to me. That's the premise we're working on. If someone truly, truly is in fear of their life, then we need to address that. Bring that up with your supervisor. Bring that up with your department chair and your dean, and let's work on that. And let's try to address that. And I think we can find the right accommodations, um, and we can try to work this forward. It is not my intention to put anybody in a situation like that. So let us work on that. Okay, thanks, Kevin. Next question uh, related to fall. How are you planning on incentivizing students to get involved fall 2021? Well, <clears throat> um, I have talked with our student affairs team and talked about our need as a campus to dramatically improve student life experience and student involvement. And it's a project charter, it's a presidential level project charter that I've given them. They are working on it right now. They are planning a series of events and activities and involvement that I think will be hopefully dramatically improved from what we've seen in the past that will uh, be a substantial improvement in that experience for our students. And we wanna entice those students into that and create that vibrant campus, campus atmosphere that is good for all of our students. It's good for retention. Um, and it's part of the experience that our students want. So we are actively working on that and I want that to happen. So I'm hoping that we will see a difference this fall. I'm also sure it won't be perfect just this fall, but it's going to start getting better. And then we will get better the next semester and the next semester after that as we continue to improve in that. But know that that is an effort and it is one of the project charters and that we're working on it. Okay, thank you. Um, by the way, before I finish, um, I had a visit with our new incoming student body president and our new incoming student body president echoes this completely. Um, in fact, that was one of the major platforms uh, of why he wanted to get elected was to see what we could do to improve that student life experience and that camp campus atmosphere. So I think we will be working hand in hand with our student government in those improvements and that I'm very excited about that. Hey, this next question is a bit lengthy, so bear with me while I read it to you. Um, we've been hearing a lot about our focus on recruiting traditional and transfer students. I know I am preaching to the choir when I say that as a state university, we have a responsibility to provide educational access and opportunity to all citizens of our state. There are many potential non-traditional and place-bound students in our region, particularly in proximity to our outreach centers. Reaching these people often requires more of a marketing focus than traditional methods used to recruit high school students. In addition to the online education charter, what are your thoughts on how we can reach out to and meet the educational needs of these people? Um, well, I couldn't agree with what you said more. Um, what I do want is that anyone feels like we have to do one or the other, that we either have to reach out to traditional students or non-traditional students, or that we, shouldn't be having um, uh, a bunch of events targeted towards traditional students because we have a large non-traditional population or that we should only be focusing on the non-traditional population because they're 
place bound in our region um, to the detriment of our traditional students. I think we can do both. I think we can do all of that. And in fact, the new strategic enrollment plan that they're working on and our strategic enrollment marketing efforts are focused on identifying all of those target markets for students and those target populations because we need to serve them all. Um, please don't anyone think that I am saying we're gonna focus on one or the other because I do not believe in that. I believe we can do both. I believe we can serve the needs of our non-traditional students and serve the needs of our traditional students and that neither one uh, needs to be mutually exclusive of the other. We, we can do that and we can do better in both of those. Okay, next question. Would it be possible to give faculty the opportunity to evaluate the VPs involved with the faculty, the VP for Health Sciences, Provost and VP for Research? Um, so the question is, is, is there a way for faculty to have an evaluation or input on the performance of those positions? Is that the question? I believe so. Okay. Um, I don't have a reason why the answer is no, but I don't think we currently have in place that type of evaluation process. Um, but if there's some feedback that um, a member of the campus community thinks we need to know about, then I think they should contact um, HR um, and bring that issue up so that it can uh, get vetted and if necessary addressed. Um, I just don't think that's currently, yeah, we, have, we have a lot of employees in so many areas of the university that everybody can effectively have input on everybody else. But if there's something we need to know, um, I would encourage someone to get a hold of someone in HR and, and, and let them know. Hey, thanks, Kevin. Next question. Do you feel that a post-pandemic world with our newly gained technological gains will mean far more online options for universities? How can we go back and ignore these gains? Won't schools that do that be left behind by those that are more fully embracing our newfound technology? Yeah, I'm sorry, the end of the question, yes. I think those that don't learn from the pandemic um, will suffer from it even further. Um, we have learned a lot about educating our students. We've learned a lot about how to do it better. Um, I'm hesitating to use the word online. I think we need a better word than that. Online has its own connotations of those asynchronous online courses taken at a different pace. When we realize that digital distance delivery of courses in synchronous formats and in hybrid and high flex formats also have their own value, there's so much more to it. One of the things the pandemic did was accelerate the issue of technology driven education delivery by several years that all had to happen right away in a way that we haven't had time to really evaluate all of its impacts. So what I have asked academic affairs to do is I've asked academic affairs to form a group to look into everything we did during the pandemic about this new um, uh, format of delivery and determine which ones were the good ones and how we continue to use and exploit those going forward. And I'm sorry, I use exploit, but in the positive sense of put those to our benefit going forward. So how can we position Idaho State University best to continue to use those new digital um, uh, and electronic delivery formats um, so that those students who otherwise couldn't participate now can participate? And it gives them an access to us that we never had before. And we need to know what those are and capitalize on those. And, and not or, and, at the same time, learn the other lesson of the pandemic, which was online and digital education is not the end all be all and not the only path forward because what we heard overwhelmingly from our students was they wanted back in the classroom. They wanted to be in person again. They wanted that experience. We had so many students say, we're not going to come back until we know we can be in person and be on campus. So there's value in both. And the institutions, that thrive and survive going forward are the ones that learn both of those lessons and how to move that forward. 
we don't ha- we do not have the luxury of ignoring those lessons about digital delivery going forward, but nor do we have the luxury of saying, hey, I learned that I can um, teach my class just as well without ever showing up on campus, so I'm not going to be in person anymore, because that's not okay either, because so many of our students want that. Um, so we have to learn both of those lessons and use them going forward. Hey, switching gears a little bit, uh, let's talk about sustainability on campus. In what ways are you planning to promote and integrate sustainability at ISU in the coming years? Well, um, I think the sustainability of our operation is important. Uh, it's something that's very important to me and in my career. I have um, in the past tried to do many things in that um, area. So it is very important to me. Um, I have asked us to start considering, for example, that in our construction of new facilities on campus or in our major renovation of facilities that we start building in sustainability measures. For example, and this is just one of many, and I'm not an architect or an engineer, but we should consider that every time we build a facility or do a major remodel, should it accommodate solar panels on the roof or other forms of sustainable power? Our facilities team is working on these concepts and how to make things more sustainable. And it's important to me that we outline a feasible plan for how we move this forward over the next few years. Because sustainability needs long-term planning and sometimes it's very expensive. Sometimes it's more expensive to do it that way than another way, which means we have to be the right, you know, prudent, uh, responsible with our public dollars. And we have to figure out the right way to spend and plan that out. And that's going to take us some time. It's not, it's, it's not an easy change, but we are going to start working on those and our facilities team is, is working on that. Okay. Thanks, Kevin. Next question um, comes to us from the YouTube uh, streaming live right now. Uh, There have been so many improvements to ISU branding, but the university doesn't have a flag flying these days. It's been missed. Sorry, I was looking out the window, but I can't quite see the flagpoles from here. Um, uh, We need to be proud of who we are. We need to be proud of our brand. And I will make sure we have a university flag on our university flagpoles. I, I guess I wasn't aware that it wasn't currently there or in there in certain places, but We'll take care of it. Okay, this next question. Um, comes to us related to commencement. Can you give us any advice on how we make sure we are celebrating our graduates? I know that many departments are not hosting the same kind of in-person celebratory event again this year. Yeah, that's right. Again, we are planning commencement in the way that we think is appropriate for health protocols. Um, our, Our RSVP numbers of our graduates are very strong for commencement this year in what, nine days from now? Um, This is very exciting uh, for our upcoming commencement ceremonies. We're expecting more graduates to participate this year than in previous ceremonies. So we've been communicating what our health and safety protocols are, and I hope everybody follows those. Uh, It's expected that we do. But it's exciting that the plan has been developed to gather together in person and hold a commencement to celebrate our students' accomplishments, because Last year, we haven't been able to do that. And this year, we are. Last year, we couldn't hold any in-person ceremonies. So I asked faculty and staff last year to reach out to students and express their congratulations. I would do the same this year, too, where that makes sense. For all faculty and staff, reach out to students, express um, those congratulations, whether it was um, an email, phone call, or whatever. Let our students know that we're proud of them. And at the same time, We celebrate the fact that we are going to be in person for commencement celebration this year like we couldn't last year, which is progress and we're moving in the right direction. 
So that would be my advice this time. Okay, uh, Kevin, we have a few separate questions regarding this next subject. Okay. Hi, Pre <laughs> Hi President Satterley. I've seen you out on the quad with a little puppy. Is that your dog? It is so cute. <laughs> That's one of our questions. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, yeah. Hang on, hang on a second. Um, let's see, where are we? Let's see if I can see everybody okay. I don't know if you can see me or not. Um, uh, this, <laughs> okay. this is Mejignord. Um, she's my new puppy. Um, she's just about nine weeks old. And so I've just had her for a short period of time. Um, she's a beagle. Um, and yeah, I've been having to take her out on the quad because she's not fully trained yet. So, um, but yeah, this is, this is her. So if you've seen me out on the quad with a puppy, yeah, this is, this is her. She's pretty tiny still, but she's new. So she's still learning her way around. She has not adopted all of our code protocols. She does a little, she does not I believe in six foot distancing. Um, so, but yes, this is, this is her. We have a lot of follow-up comments about how cute okay. she is and they want to know the, the name again. Okay. Um, her name is Mejignord. Um, Mejignord is, um, from ancient Norse mythology. Um, uh, the, in ancient Norse mythology, Thor had several items. Um, the one that most people know about commonly now because of the Marvel movies is Thor had a hammer named Mjolnir. Um, I didn't want to pick that because that's too pop culture at the moment. Um, so um, some of Thor's other items, he had, um, he had, um, he had a, uh, he had a chariot um, and the chariot was pulled by two magical goats, um, Tengrisner and Tengyoster, which are translated into tooth gnasher and tooth grinder. Uh, but I only adopted one puppy, so I couldn't pick between tooth gnasher and tooth grinder. If I'd have gotten two of them, I would have, that would have been their names, tooth gnasher and tooth grinder. Um, his other items, he had an iron glove um, that helped him wield Milner. Um, the glove's name was Jaren Gretner. Um, Jaren Gretner is an even harder name than, to say than Mejignard, so an iron glove's not that inspiring. So I ended up picking the last of uh, Thor's magical items, which is Mejignard. The Mejignard was Thor's belt of strength. So when he would wear it, it would double his strength. And it, it's the name of his magical belt was Mejignard. So that's Mejignard, but as I've come to discover around the office, um, uh, everyone else just calls her Meji uh, for short, which is probably good because if I had picked Yaren Gretner, everybody would just call her Yaren, which I don't like that. So that's Meji um, or Mejignard, uh, whichever you choose. Excellent. <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. Um, those are all the questions that we have right now. Um, perhaps we should do a last call for questions. Okay. Is that it then, Jenny? Um, we have a couple more coming in. Okay. Looks like we still have some time if that's all right. Yeah. Give me one second.
Okay. Um, and believe we have questions about measuring art, but multiple questions, Kevin. Multiple questions, and even more responses once mm -hmm. they saw her. <laughs> okay. Can you give us an update on the alumni center? Oh yeah. Um, it's currently out to bid. Um, the process to to build a building like that um, it has to go through the state division of public works, and then uh, all of the plans have to be done, and then they have to be approved by the state division of building safety. And there's lots of state processes in that. All of those are done. Um, the plans are approved um, by the state, and so it is now out to bid with contractors. And so they will all submit their sealed bids, and I'm not sure what day. Uh, bidding is done. I'm sorry, I don't have that off the top of my head, but it's out to bid right now. Then they'll open the bids, um, award the bids to the winning contractor um, to begin construction. So I'm super excited to see this addition to our campus. I'm looking forward to uh, a groundbreaking ceremony as soon as we know uh, when that uh, the bids are all done. Okay, thanks, Kevin. Um, okay, this one's a bit lengthy, so get ready for that. Um, recruitment and retention is a bigger issue now than ever before. Several conversations are taking place to tackle this issue and map out a path forward. Those conversations talk about ISU as a whole. However, when looking closer, that conversation is geared toward benefiting Pocatello and not the outreach campuses as well. The outreach campuses are usually a different animal altogether with their own strengths, but the conversations taking place do not leverage those strengths. In addition, there is a lack of support from departments and leadership to support the outreach campuses, and there is a big fear that those campuses will close down. How can we change this attitude so that outreach can have some level of autonomy and support to play the, to their strengths? Okay, there's a lot built into that question. Let me start by saying this. Um, we need to um, bolster our uh, recruitment and retention at every one of our locations, period. It needs to happen everywhere. So that is what we need to work on. If the, right now it's being uh, felt that there isn't uh, enough emphasis at Idaho Falls or Twin Falls or Meridian, then we'll need, we'll need to address that because it does have to happen. But let me say this because of what was built into one part of that answer. There is no plan, none, to close Idaho Falls or Meridian or Twin Falls. None. That is not the direction we're going. Let me give a larger answer than what was directly asked. I think there was, at times in the past, at Idaho State University, a siloing of some of our operations, of colleges or departments who were incentivized to do what was best for them. And as long as they did what was best for them, they could thrive. What that led to was a lack of sense of we all need to do what's best for ourselves and all of us and all of the other departments. No college on this campus, no department on this campus can thrive if others are failing. We have to be in this together. If we are going to grow our enrollments in Idaho Falls, for example, it requires, requires everyone on the Pocatello campus and the Meridian campus and the Twin Falls campus of being dedicated to the success of the Idaho Falls campus. If we have departments that are making decisions on one campus that adversely are affecting the other ones, we need to address that because that's not okay. But I think in the past, there were incentives in place that made that happen. And we need to break those down because we are all going to get better when we all get better. If you look, I'm not just going to focus on Idaho Falls, but it's the example that's coming to mind at the moment. If you look at the population in the Idaho Falls region versus the population in the Pocatello region, there are more people living in the Idaho Falls region. We need to serve that area. There is no valid reason why we should continue to have enrollment declines there. If we all pull together and do it, we can have 
um, great enrollment increases and retention increases. And why do we do those? Because our students need it. Because we need to do right by our students and give them that chance to better their life through education. And we can do that. So the answer to the person who asked this question is yes, we need to focus on all that. And if we're not there yet, it's not because we're excluding it, it's because we're going to get there and we're going to work on those. But please don't reach the conclusion that anyone is being left out, let alone intentionally left out, because we have to do better and we're going to do better. Okay, thanks Kevin. Next question, what do you see as the biggest challenge for ISU at this moment? What are your priorities and how do you plan to tackle these issues? Well, first of all, as you know, we started a strategic planning effort a year ago, then we stopped it due to the COVID and the pandemic. We're going to be restarting it again this fall. So we are really gonna map out our future and what some of those priorities are. Until we have that, our priorities remain the same. Recruitment and retention of students as our top priority, uh, building our infrastructure and all the pieces of our infrastructure, not just physical, but the way we do things, our policies, our practices, about reaching out to business and industry and making connections with our community and making those connections with all of our constituencies so they can help us out. Uh, working on items like that continue to be our focus, continue to be um, our goals, because if we do those, we will continue to get better and do right by our students while we write a strategic plan and map out our way forward. So we're going to continue to work on those um, principles. And underlying all of that is working on our culture. Underlying all of that is the goal of working on our culture, of being the institution we want to be, to be the workplace we all want to have, and, and being proud of our brand and who we are and, and building that. Um, that stays within all that too. Those are our priorities. Okay, Kevin, we have some feedback saying thank you for the communication and the opportunity to ask questions. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have some comments saying that Meji needs an orange collar. <laughs> so you can work on that. That's fair, fair feedback. Next question. I have seen information about the university SEM plan. Can you please explain what this is? Um, SEM is short for strategic enrollment management. It's trying to build a long-term strategic plan as to how we're going to address our enrollment declines. Um, there are short-term pieces, tactical things we need to start on now, but we need a long-term strategy to address where we are um, in working on our enrollments. And that's what SEM stands for. Um, and that's a plan that Student Affairs and Enrollment Management is, uh, is working on. Okay. Next question. What is the status of the ISU Commission on Equity and Inclusion that a request for five employees was sent out in? I'm sorry, can you, can you say that again? What is, sure, what is the status of the ISU Commission on Equity and Inclusion that a request for five employees was sent out in December 2020? Um, we are working on a commission to, to forming a commission on equity and inclusion, and we were looking for at-large members that we still don't have yet um, for that commission. Um, I think that was what was sent out in December, as I recall. Uh, if someone has that specific question, um, please reach out to Stacy Gibson. She probably would you have a better answer than me at the moment on exactly where we are. Okay, so that is all the questions that I see right now, Kevin. Um, I would love to turn it back over to you for any closing remarks. Well, I don't know that I have a lot by way of closing remarks right now. Um, but thank you all for participating again. Um, I'm glad we do these sessions. I hope that um, they're of some useful and they're of some value to everyone. Um, we are in difficult times in higher education right now, uh, but uh, we are working very diligently to try to work through these for the best interest of our institution and our students. So we are working on those. 
So in, in all of the serious things we have to talk about, um, what's going on with our budget and how higher ed is viewed in the state right now is something we are paying very close attention to. So please know that we are working on that. And thank you for all of your questions and concern in that area. On the not quite so serious and a little more frivolous, um, thank you for the questions about Mission Yard. <laughs> it was unexpected, but, um, but I appreciate that. And thank you all for being here today. And I'll look forward to when we can talk again soon. So thanks, everybody. <laughs>